Uh, okay, my name's Logan Roberts. Uh, I go to Guilford High School, obviously. <laughs> and yeah, I did my capstone project on designing a house. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in architecture, so I decided to structure my project around that. So that's really it. <laughs> okay, and you have a video that you made and we're gonna play it. Yep. All right, here we go. And for those of you who are tuning in, you could use the chat feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen if you have any questions um, or comments, and I'll read those at the end. If anyone can't hear this or see this, please also make a comment um, and let me know. All right, here we go. Hello, my name is Logan Roberts, and I did my project on designing a house. So the goal of this presentation is to show you how to design a house with minimal help from outside sources like an architect. This is a, a do-it-yourself guide that is going to take you through the logistical process of home design. So the factors of home design um, basically boils down to the design process, which includes legal requirements and budget. It's not all aesthetic based which I'll get into later. So some things you shouldn't worry too much about when doing your initial sketches of your home would be electric, plumbing, and engineering. These are still important, but you shouldn't worry too much about them initially. So the design process, um, the key elements of the design process boil down to the five things listed here. So firstly, you wanna inspect and understand your site, which is your land or property. Secondly, you wanna brainstorm ideas um, your ideas will be heavily based off the style of home you're looking for, and I'm going to be focusing on New England style homes. So thirdly, you want to create schematic. Logan, are you saying you can't hear it? Yeah, the audio is cut. Okay. I hmm. think it's fixed though, because I couldn't hear you either. So maybe if you just play it again, it might work. Okay, let's try it again. Yeah, well, it works. Okay, it works now. Utilities, mm -hmm. which includes water, oil, things like that. Topography, which is just the land, the terrain. Accessibility, which includes human and vehicle accessibility. Light, which includes natural and artificial light. Views, vegetation, weather and wind, and sustainability, which is just making your home as eco-friendly as possible. So for us, especially on the shoreline in New England, we need to adapt our homes to the fickle weather patterns and design your home around the environment, which I'll get into later. So regulations. Um, there are two main things you wanna do in terms of regulations before you begin your design. Firstly, you wanna know the rules and laws of a site before you begin design. So things like septic placement, eyesore and construction laws. Um, you also wanna to try to understand what is possible to build on a site. So I'd recommend for this, finding a local civil engineer and just running your ideas over with him or her. And your construction rules and laws are posted on your town website or should be at least for Guilford. Um, that's pretty common. So you could do your own research there. So utilities, things like water, oil, um, they should definitely be taken into account along with the town government rules. So many towns have septic regulations, like I mentioned before. Um, trenching, which is digging up land to put pipes for plumbing or electric. Uh, when overlooked, it can become an issue because it can obstruct pre-existing structures or vegetation that the town deems important. So once again, you want to discuss your utilities with the civil engineer if you think they might be a problem. Uh, this really just depends on your property and where it's located. So utilities like water, electric, and oil are, are 
oil are actually rarely ever problems. Um, it's mainly the stuff I just mentioned. So the main takeaway for utilities that you should always check to see if your site is buildable with the town. You don't want to be building on an unbuildable site uh, that can get you in some trouble. So topography, which is your land. The main rule here is that you want your house to mesh well with the terrain. So the topography determines the layout and exterior design of the home. Um, it's basically synonymous with your site. A uh, perfect example of an ideal adaption to topography is Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Um, his design works perfectly with the landscape and it's built well around that waterfall there and the environment. So Falling Water might seem like an extreme example, but the design elements he uses and how they work with the topography is applicable to any type of home design, even in Guilford. A more applicable example in Guilford, though, would be like adding a dock or porch facing the water if you have a property on the water. And a example from Guilford here on the bottom left is a house built into a hill. So it's an example of a home working well with its environment. Accessibility. Okay, so when you think of accessibility, you might initially think maybe a handicapped family member who needs a ramp or something, but accessibility ranges from people to vehicles as well. So you also want to make sure that your garage will be large enough to fit your car. This is really just common sense, but they're definitely things I mentioned because you don't want to overlook them and regret them later. Um, in terms of possible issues with your town's accessibility rules or laws, if you're building directly off of the street, um, as many homes are built off the street and connect to the main road, you're going to want a level to stop where the street meets the road and make a smooth transition so there will be no problems with the change in elevation. And you may also need to drain water from your access road to avoid erosion after pavement is placed or whatever material you're using for your driveway. Um, in terms of aesthetic, you're going to want to emphasize your entrance with some steps. You could do a pediment, as you see in the bottom right image there. And this will offset the size of your garage or your driveway. So that's an aesthetic tip there. Um, you should also definitely avoid having your garage directly at the end of a driveway because you want to be pulling up to the front door, not a garage. Um, it's often ugly to have your garage directly at the end of your driveway. Uh, you can make it work, but it usually doesn't work. So for light, natural and artificial light, you want to attempt to make the most ideal use of natural lighting, which will minimize the necessity for artificial energy, which in turn increases sustainability, which is what we're trying to do. Um, you, want to try, you want to try to have natural light reach basically every room of the house. Um, and a way to achieve this is to angle your house towards the west, which is the most ideal direction um, in order to catch light and heat during the day. Um, you also want to make sure you have lots of windows facing the west to let in natural light and heat. Um, moreover, you want to have the floor plan accommodate as much natural light where it makes sense. So this goes back to the common sense thing. If you have a room with a fireplace, um, you're going to want to make sure that the room with no fireplace catches light over the room with the fireplace. The so room with the fireplace already has that heating aspect, unlike the room with no fireplace. So it's really just common sense stuff. Um, views. So you always want to have large openings face the best view your property provides. Obviously the views your property provides will depend on your budget. Um, if you're living on the water and you presumably have a high budget, you want to definitely make sure to focus the opened area of your home facing the water. So this will impact your interior and exterior design. Um, one specific problem you're going to want to avoid is the elevated west problem. So the afternoon sun is the hottest during, and it's the hottest time of the day when the sun's in that position. So to avoid this, you can install electric lines and or an awning um, that will avoid letting in all that excess heat. Vegetation. Uh, the decision to remove, keep, or add vegetation should be determined by the size, location, type. So I have a few examples here. 
uh, if you have a tree near a power line near on your property on your site and it's large or old, it would be definitely smart to cut it down early in your design process or cut it out of your sketches. Um, you can build over it or something. And if you have trees that obstruct your view, you want to take them down as best you can. You might have a neighbor whose property is obstructing your view. And yeah, that's a problem you just have to sort out, but definitely do as much you can on your own property to get the best view that you paid for. If you want to add trees, you want to try to avoid planting on top of plumbing or septic to avoid structural problems. So you want to know where your plumbing and septic is so that you don't run into any problems later. Um, and if there's natural vegetation you aren't sure about removing, consult a local botanist or research the plant type yourself. So uh, one plant you definitely want to avoid would be bamboo. It's very invasive and it can grow into your neighbor's yards and that's something you definitely don't want. So weather and winds. You want to know your weather and wind patterns. Um, it is crucial for home design, especially in the northeast, where we experience every season to a very high degree. Um, you want a house that accommodates each season well. So this is why you see triangular roofs all over Guildford because it snows during the winter and no one wants a flat roof where, you know, their house is going to cave in after too much weight is put on. Uh, you also want to create outdoor living spaces facing southeast specifically because they are protected from cool winds and will allow you to enjoy, enjoy outdoor living conditions into the cooler seasons. So if you're adding some kind of outdoor extension to your home, definitely make it face southeast as much as it possibly can. In Guilford, uh, you'll see screen and porches, um, which should, as I just said, should be facing southeast and they close during colder seasons. And it's just an example of a home design that adapts to the weather very well. Um, and it allows the homeowner to enjoy their addition throughout every season, which is why a lot of people move to Connecticut. Uh, another optional design choice would be to place your garage on the side of the home which catches wind, but obviously this is very specific and it would have to work with the rest of your design. So sustainability. Every topic I just discussed play into, plays into sustainability. So to maximize sustainability, you must understand your site, which means taking all the things I just mentioned into account. And the main thing is using common sense. Um, so you want to know your legal, financial, practical limitations. You want to use natural materials available to you like oak and granite to maximize sustainability. So you don't want to be having materials shipped or you want to mitigate having materials shipped from large distances to lower carbon emissions. And you also want to find the balance between aesthetic, sustainability and function. Find the balance between aesthetic, sustainability, and function. That is the main thing I want you to take away for sustainability. So the next step of the design process is brainstorming ideas, which is heavily based on the style of home you're looking for. Um, there are a lot of styles you could pick from. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on New England specific styles, obviously because we're in New England. So some New England style homes that you see all over New England and in the Cape include colonial Cape Cod style and contemporary. And you can take aspects of one style and mix it with another. Each style is linked to each other through history, which I'll talk about. So each style works well with one another. So all these styles may seem overwhelming at first, but I'm gonna break them down for you. So firstly, you have the colonial style home, um, which is obviously linked to the colonial period of US history, which is the 17th and 18th centuries. And these designs are highly derivative of English and Dutch architecture. English architecture is derivative of Dutch architecture, and the English are the ones who migrated to America during the colonial era. So the key elements are brick chimneys, horizontal sidings, which are usually vinyl, but they can also be wood, uh, heavy use of pediments, panel window frames, a pretty simple layout, as you can see in the bottom left there, white picket fences, gabled roof, which means the roof comes off to a triangular end, and traditional interiors. So you see these all around Guildford and the shoreline. Um, and there's an example on the bottom right there, George Hubbard's historical colonial home in Connecticut. Um, so yeah, you see those everywhere. And also on the bottom left, the floor plan, um, that's a typical colonial floor plan. You definitely see this 
walking into 90% of houses in Guildford, you walk in and there's a staircase that goes straight up and it just breaks off into the squared off rooms. So these homes are very sustainable and they fit very well within the New England landscape. Um, most houses in Connecticut specifically are colonial. So definitely building a newer colonial like the one here on the left will fit in very well. So secondly, you have Cape Cod slash Colonial Revival. Um, like I said, these are derivative of colonial style homes. They take elements from colonial style homes, including the dormer windows, as you can see on the bottom right. Um, some element, other elements they take would be the brick chimneys, the, the heavy use of pediments, panel window frames, things like that. Um, the main differences in these types of homes are in the siding and the interior design. So for Cape Cod homes, you'll typically see wooden shingled siding, that kind of aged shingled siding that a lot of people like. Um, and the interior is usually much more modern and sleek looking rather than colonial and traditional. So an example of that's there on the bottom left, a lot of white colors. So this style of home fits very well into the traditional Guilford theme of homes, obviously as it's derivative of colonial style homes. And they're made with available and eco-friendly materials, so they're sustainable as well. The last type of home I'll be going over is the New England Contemporary Home. So this style of home takes inspiration from the last two, but it has more notable differences than the last two do from each other. So the key elements of this type of home, as you'll see, brick chimney, shingled, um, paneled windows, it's very similar to the other two styles, but the main differences are in layout, roofs, and the use of materials, which I explained here. So there's no more cookie cutter layout. It's You can do a lot more with your layout. You can be a lot more creative. You have more flexibility to use different shapes. So for example, you could have flat roofs and triangular roofs, but if you have a flat roof, you just have to know that it's gonna be a bit less functional um, and you're taking a functional hit in favor of aesthetics. And it really just comes down to your personal choice. So another difference are varied siding and materials that you can see in the bottom right here. So you don't need to stick to one siding throughout the entire exterior. Uh, these homes work very well within Guilford uh, as the incorporate aspects of the last two types of home I discussed. And here are some examples. So the next step of the design process, creating a schematic slash a 3D sketch. Um, like I said, you could do this on paper, but we have so many online programs that are available to us and are very well made, such as 3D Architect, ArchiCAD, SoftPlan, SketchUp. Um, the problem is that some of these can cost a lot of money, hundreds or even thousands of dollars for their full versions. So I would just recommend getting the free trial of SketchUp. Um, this program allows you to draw out your basic design without much needed experience. And here are some pictures of a house that I was working on. Um, it, it doesn't really involve any physics. It's just getting your basic idea out. So I guess this would be a Cape Cod style home. And for a more comprehensive program, I would definitely recommend SoftPlan, which was introduced to me by my advisor, Dr. Carlson. So SketchUp does come with a floor plan uh, program built in, but SoftPlan is a lot more organized and has a much better user interface, in my opinion. Um, it could get hard to, it, it, it's a hard program to learn at first, but once you get the hang of it, you can build stuff fairly quickly. And something I like about this um, is that if you're doing your project and you want it to come to life. It has a built-in price calculator, which will tell you how much it actually costs to build your house. And this is one of the few programs that you can get a free trial of that has this feature. Um, so here you can see a small house I made uh, on the soft plan program. So after you use the program, it becomes pretty easy to use. Um, you can, there's a whole form for soft plan and you can also use YouTube as well to learn how to use the program. So this house down here would be a Cape Cod style house. So here are some more pictures from the house. There's a basic floor plan. Um, it comes with preset windows and doors and stuff you could pick from. So you don't need to make all that yourself. It's already there. And it also does all the measurements out for you, which is very nice. 
and you could build on a 2d plane or a 3d plane and it all will work with each other it all it all adds to itself which is very helpful and there's the general interior layout so those are just some different pieces of furniture that the program gives you you can get a basic idea of what you want the inside to look like so the final stage at this stage you want to make any final modifications to your sketches or schematics uh, so that you have a product you're happy with and you won't need to modify after you send it off um, you will need to get the necessary permits to make sure your house follows code so this could include an a2 survey um, a check from the coastal area management fema etc it really just depends on where you're building and specifically which state you're building in so finally you send your designs off to a contracting company and it could go back and forth from there but you're basically finished at that point with your main design so to conclude almost anyone can design a home on their own without much outside help so it may seem like a daunting task at first but if you just follow my steps it could be an engaging and enjoyable process so I want to give a quick thanks to my mentor and advisor, uh, Duo Dickinson, Dr. Carlson. Uh, they helped me throughout this process and their help was much appreciated. So yeah, thanks for watching. Nice job, Logan. Really impressive. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to open up, I'm going to stop the share. Um, we're going to open up the chat feature for those of you who are tuning in. If anyone has questions or comments, I could read those aloud. So tell us um, what kind of inspired you to do this project? What kind of um, background interest did you have that made you want to learn more about this? Uh, well, I've, I've just always been interested in architecture and home design. So when I wanted to do a capstone project, it seemed like it just was the perfect fit for me. Absolutely. And you seem to have a lot of background knowledge already and that you've also learned a lot in this project as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. Was there any courses at GHS that kind of helped with this project? Uh, yeah, um, Mr. Carlson or Dr. Carlson's um, architectural drafting class definitely helped and drafting in general yeah. um, was very helpful. Also just taking um, any art courses really, like drawing is also very helpful to hone those skills. So yeah. That makes sense. How about math? Do you feel like you needed to know any geometry or math? Uh, in terms of design, no, not really. You don't really need to know any math, but I'm also interested in that. That's just not what my presentation was on. <laughs> I don't I don't think as many people care for that as design, honestly. <laughs> now, um, do you have any uh, career interests in drafting or architecture? Yeah, I, I want to be an architect. So um, okay. so the, my mentor, um, Duo Dickinson, I have a position at his firm and I'm an intern there. Oh, and wow. yep, it's a lot of fun. So very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, nice job tonight. Um, 